called me Gilgadaddy. Oh. Rings of Power, Episode 5, where the shipping continues. Together we can fight. Alendia. You have to do that sexy <laughs> thing. No more here. The RPMs increase. You have to roll your R's. Sauron. 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 Mordor. Mordor. Elrond. What is your favorite word or phrase to say? I had a bit of black speech. And Amazon announced that season two has reached 40 million global viewers. Or as another Amazon business said, Slay bestie. Gilgit daddy. Except despite how much Rings of Power is slaying. He does slay in a certain way. He does. He does slay. <laughs> Sorry, just got a bit dazzled. <laughs> All isn't quite as it seems, as those 40 million viewers are from its first 11 days and seems to have come across all four episodes. So that could be 20 million, 10 million, 5 million, and 5 million, and you'd still brag about 40 million viewers despite losing 50% of your audience each episode. This is one of those times where we like desperately need more information before that's even slightly worth a cause for celebration. And of course, as season one touted 25 million million viewers in its first day. This proves the series' most recent outing appears to be significantly lagging behind its first. From Variety. And what's their marketing plan to get people back into season two? Well, it's shipping evil, isn't it? Do you feel bad that you got everybody to crush on you as Halbrand, and now You've revealed yourself to be absolutely the worst. And despite Daily Beast saying that Charlie Vickers Sauron is officially TV's best villain, I still don't think that's a reason to get Galadriel to start trying to bang him. Charlie Vickers turns up at your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Wait, a yeah, I probably would, yeah. Let alone the people that write that, thinking that they have the moral high ground. As J.D. Payne, one of the showrunners, said the Fellowship had to look to each other and to those who support it and remember what it's fighting for. More shipping than you can take a stick at. I'm not even sure what you are fighting for at this point. Please, sir, can I thirst over Sauron some more? More? But when we see millions of people watching this and responding positively, that's who we're fighting for. And to those who watch every episode and negatively write about it on social media or make YouTube videos. Hello, we're happy to have you guys too. It wouldn't be a journey through Middle Earth without some trolls along the way. You mock that which is sacred. I mock that which is absurd. It's impossible to disagree with me or not like what I do without being a troll. Says the guy trying to get Galadriel to bend over for Sauron. What word would you use? Thirsty. Before Sarah ravaged her. <laughs> it's great, very tall. Oh! She's an elf disgrace. Or a sealed door to do it for his new Mordor lover. Can't believe you're here. Who worships Sauron? I don't know, Mr. Payne. Maybe people may take your comments a bit more seriously if your show wasn't so patently evil. How the turntables. I've just noticed from this Galadriel fight, when she draws her arrow, barely. It's not even pointing at his face. And it's not like he moves it either. He just grabs it and puts it out. Look how far away from his face that is. In fact, the stupid thing is he then points it closer to his own face. Galadriel, you really are crap at that. Let me help you aim. But we start with the dwarven ring pop, quite possibly one of the ugliest rings ever made. The rings can do ASMR. He visits the dwarves trying to dig a shaft to the sunlight. I knew I shouldn't have walked past that MRI machine with metal still on my hands. Electromagnetism's a bit. Turns out that the ring has told him where to dig through the stone, rather than fixing the mine, which I thought was the entire point of the rings. The mine is still just as destroyed as it was before. It's just now they can dig around it. Sire, that's a foundation wall. I'm sorry? Aren't you digging underground through solid rock? <laughs> like, no! That one bit of rock over there holds up the mountain. Are you explaining Delvecraft to me? Maybe it'd be good if the audience knew, being that we're not dwarves. But they refuse to dig, and so the king decides to do it himself. <laughs> You didn't need a ring, you needed a JCB. You wanted a pneumatic drill, that's what you wanted. But the king keeps digging, and honestly... <laughs> he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. It hasn't changed. And in fact, even after a time delay we cut back, he still seems to be standing in the same spot as before. Don't you think you better stop for some air? Jorin, you're making Jorin look lazy, Jorin. But all the ceiling starts to rumble, everything seems about to collapse on them. And he still doesn't seem to have moved from his location. Surely if we're digging to the sunlight, there should be like a tunnel that he's walked up. No, instead, a sunlight streams through a hole which is far too tall for him to have hit. That's like twice the height of the dwarf. 
Wait, how did you dig a hole through that distance? Pig's only about that big. <laughs> this isn't how mining works. Next time I ordered you to dig, you do so. They may agree to do so now, but what about once they've heard the worst speech of all time? Because he goes through and finds other places for them to dig. Yeah. Yes, on that corner of stone specifically. And after an entire scene of him digging to sunlight and them using evil rings in order to gain sunlight. <laughs> Spending an entire episode talking about how their crops were dying because they didn't have sunlight. What is the very next line that we're about to hear? Pity those who dwell above, slaves to the sun. I'm sorry! Your entire storyline this season is about how you desperately need sun. Chained to a ceaseless rhythm of waking and sleep. So are you! I'm not sure why you're so obsessed with sunlight in this series. But you are. In fact, Rings of Power dwarves are so obsessed with the sunlight, they are covered in it so much, this dwarf actually developed biological protection in his skin from the sunlight. He must be out in it all the time. In Kazakh doom, we are free of its tyranny. What do you mean? You can't say that while giving us a montage. Even Rocky had a montage. Where you're desperate to get sunlight back into your caves. Look how excited these people were when they got it. <laughs> Loves it. We bring the sun to us. What do you even mean? You opened a pissing window. I am not a slave to the tyranny of the sun. So I close the curtains. That means I control the sun itself. We don't need the sun. After an entire series of you doing nothing but desperate to get the sun back. That ring doesn't make you evil. It makes you retarded. It is daybreak once more in our mountain. What do you even mean? At last it is daybreak. How did you first start this speech? Pity those who dwell above Slaves to the sun, chained to its ceaseless rhythm of waking and sleep. Oh, pity those above chained to its rhythm. Yeah, it's daybreak! The sun comes from the same pissing place when that goes down. It leaves your tunnels as well. You're not making a sun. Oh, I knew they were tiny, but I didn't know it referred to their brains. <laughs> I wouldn't have cheered, I'd have pushed him over the side. Maybe you should have written a script for this guy first rather than just down and just say whatever was on the top of his head. No, look, yeah, there's Deezer and her loyal follower. The only two people in the entire mountain that think, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something wrong here. My dangly sense is tingling. Celebrimbor, though, brings together elves and dwarves and they have a new door to Casa Doom. The doors of Durin. I remember. The new west gate of our mountain. Unbreachable. I bet Sauron could breach Dorin's back doors. Seems to be breaching everybody else's. Oh, Sauron ravaged. <laughs> but as Celebrimbor is giving his speech, Sauron starts acting like a miserable wife. Sorry, it's a bit redundant. Like a wife. Try checking his pockets. <laughs> so he walks off as Celebrimbor's other servant. And no doubt Sauron has been working out whether he can breach her Westgate as well. We should remember this. This is a character that Rings of Power made up, who so far has just felt sorry for Sauron because, oh, what a thirst after him. She is the target audience for them to project onto. If I was there, I'd feel sorry for Satan and that he was injured as well. Come in out of the dark. You shall be removed by force. She said you'd say that. She literally turned evil because Sauron was wet and she wanted to be. So a lasting friendship between- He's oh no, he's going upstairs. He stands outside brooding. Too much? My remarks? I encouraged you to keep it short. They are just a married couple. You can't convince me otherwise. I told you to shut up, but what you knew? Do not recall you saying that. That's because she's gaslighting you. I mean, he's gaslighting you. You do not always listen. Do you have an idea set in your head? You never listen to me, do you? I told you, I told you what to get at the supermarket. Rings of Power is a soap opera for Bridgerton fans. Truth is, I should have spoken longer to credit your content. Or just walk off and ignore the whiny little bit. That's also an option. What's Sauron gonna make you do? Sleep on the sofa? Your pissing tower. When he starts going, I'm so sorry, Mordor is impacting the humans. And that means I can't stay festive and happy like you. I can't forget the suffering of people that I've never met. The people in foreign nations who did it themselves that have absolutely nothing to do with me. Rings for men. Oh, I knew you'd bring that up again. I did not say anything about rings. Are you mentally retarded? Or do you just think I am? You can really sense the IQ level of the creators in this one. I never mentioned it myself. And everyone else is thinking, but we all know what you meant. You're not as clever as you think you are, you dumb gal. Well, I never said the words, so now it's... No, that's not how language works. It is a game you play. Sowing seeds in others' minds and then convincing them that the fruit is of their own fault. That is far too much of an intellectual response to someone going, I never said the words. I just hinted at it. You can't blame me for things that I insinuate. I thought our minds were as one. In this. If you loved me, you'd make rings for men. Have you had a change of heart? This is a night for dwarves. It did for a second there. I think he said divorce. 
not dwarves. I was going to cheer that Calibrimbor may have finally found his dangly bits. We shall speak of men tomorrow. I have a feeling, Calibrimbor, that you speak of men every day. I would prefer to speak of them now. He just pulls out a DVD copy of the full Monty. Much of the misery of men is of their own making. And Galadriel <laughs> says it's the people of Mordor. They're serving Adar anyway. They helped him get his victory. Not all of them. Well, we already resettled them in Numenor. It's like, well, you should have done, should they? You should have left them there in Mordor so they can fight for their nation instead of ruining somebody else's. You can't home them in Numenor. It is remarkable, but fractured. I fear Numenor. I bet you do, Sauron. If you'd spent more time forging armored gauntlets, and rather than rings, you may still be alive today. But they go back and forth. I was hoping the rings may stabilize Numenor. No, they're too corruptible. And Sauron's final gambit is, well, not all of them. <laughs> yes, we know they're evil and destroy everything and have destroyed where they came from, but there might be a few of them that wouldn't destroy civilization if they appeared inside it. Why don't we recruit them instead and just them? Because that's not going to go horribly wrong. We identify nine ring bearers with the nine greatest mortal kingdoms. Nine. At least Calibrimbo's still saying no. Nine. But then we get a call back to season one, and it didn't make sense in season one. The perfection of the three. Thrice perfected. Yeah. I'm assuming they thought this was really clever when they made the rings in the wrong order. So they start with three, then there's a middle group that goes wrong. It's like, well, then we've made three rings, and we've made rings three times, and we can make nine of them, which is three times three. It's thrice perfected. Oh. For our third forging. The entire idea of three being balanced is just something that happened to be said randomly that didn't make sense at the time. Celebrimbor, though, despite the nagging, the gaslighting, and the emotional manipulation, is having none of it. We have done great things, but there shall be no rings for men. We will not tempt fate here. All in all, in this scene, they did make Sauron an incredible female character. He knew all the tricks. They pulled out every stereotype. Very well. As he walked off, they should have just asked, What's wrong? Nothing. I mean, I never thought I'd see a scene where Celebrimbor was the most masculine person in the room. Just goes to, rings of power can always surprise you. I shall make the nine myself. Like with that line. Well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do the job myself. And then they do it really badly. So the bloke has to come along and go, fine, fine, I'll do it. I don't want you to annihilate the house. <laughs> They are a married couple, I swear. Over to Numenor now, and you're witnessing Dumb, and... Well, he can't, he's not just Dumber. He's more like Mirror Universe Barry Allen, the slowest person alive, and evil for absolutely no reason whatsoever. The age of men is upon us, father. Let us take it. I think you'd need more testosterone for that one, mate. But then, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, he goes, by the way, your mom prophesied that you were going to die in a horrific way. Maybe it has to be seen to be believed. Your mother prophesied that you would come to ill end. Why did you switch? The sounds like you could make Numenor whatever you wanted. Your mom said you were gonna die in pain and agony. What a cow. He doubles down on it though. If you serve me well and succeed in the mission I give you, I'll tell you how you're going to die in agony. It doesn't really seem like a good deal to me. My mom was a lunatic. Over to Muriel now, stuck in a tower, being as useful there as she was as a queen. Overthrowing her is the best thing that ever happened to Numenor. It's like, we can put this right. The Sea Guard's still loyal. We can take the city back. Together we can fight. Alendia. I'm shipping them. There's nothing else happening in the episodes that's any good, so I'm gonna ship them instead. If there's nothing here to stimulate the brain, maybe it can stimulate flooding the room. I mean, oh. It was you who opened my heart again to the way of the faithful. Well, that explains how you came to lead the army while also losing every battle we've seen you take part in. I'm sure you opened up areas of her as well. She asked him what he saw in the Palantir though, and it was just him on a horse riding away from the city. He didn't know why. What a pathetic ball. You gave up your city for something that tells people that, oh, I can see the future. I'm having cheese for tea. It convinces her though that it means that the future's changed for Numenor because he didn't see its destruction. And so now he must double down and reinforce its current path because as she's not leader, it won't be destroyed. This is extremely convincing when you have somebody who is such a pathetic leader. Madison's kingship is a part of that path. Based. And so are you. You've got to become his queen. No matter what they try and take, you must not jeopardize Numenor's new destiny. Yes, let them take anything. Let them push anywhere. As hard as they want. I ship them. We cut over to the Sea Guard giving up their uniforms to the new rulers. Anyone deemed loyal to the queen has been stripped of rank. And is that who told you to do that? Oh, mine. Evil and eviler really should have known better than to give her power and the other version of herself in drag. <laughs> So she's desperately trying to pretend she's not evil. No, they would have had you all for treason. After she overthrew the queen herself. She tells him, though, you must take care. You're walking a treacherous path as a threat. And yours is made of seawater. Take care to keep your feet beneath you. And 
remember. It's impossible to be intimidated by a tiny little woman. It can't happen. You're walking a treacherous path back. Like, it's the only thing that should have happened in the scene. And that's a problem with all of this. You can't set up a situation where the solution is to just kill the people. Because if the people are doing something horrific to you, and you don't take the obvious solution, and they keep doing more horrific things to you, this isn't political maneuvering. But because he was given absolutely terrible advice by the Queen of just bend over and let the entire city burn, he gives him his horde back. Captain leaving deck! This guy is annoyed because people don't give him that respect. He's basically like the diminutive little cow we've had to put up with earlier. He's nobody's captain now. Of course, nobody listens to him because he has absolutely no authority. The little dig causes the captain to turn around though, and you thought, okay, this is gonna be an epic speed. No. Even he is like, come on then, let's hear your rousing speech. He's right. Cheers. Yeah, uh, that's good. I don't know why you felt the need to extend the scene, really. Instead, he just goes, no, you're right. I'm not a captain. Captain. And they're too thick to realize and just salute him anyway. And so he just walks off. He's like, what was the point of turning around if you're just going to go, no, the guy's right. I am an idiot. They all start shouting, though, my captain, my captain. May the valor protect you. He's like, that's enough. That's enough. You, you can stop complimenting him now. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's, that's enough. enough. How do you think this ends? Silence. Or what? What are you going to do? You've really written yourself into a dead end here because you've made him incredibly weak. So why would anyone respect him? Well, at the same time, making all of the people support them. Muriel isn't the leader now. They are the proper rulers. The people do want them to be leader. So, And so you've made the legitimate leaders that everybody wants to just be weak and feeble and obviously visually so. What you end up with is a story that just comes across as farcical. This guy is the legitimate ruler. That makes the people you're portraying as heroes the bad guys. Except you can't get behind either party due to how poorly you've betrayed the people that everyone wants. You're like, no one would want them as leaders. Look at them. The only reason anyone even voted for them is because the the person you put them against, pissing Muriel. Anything's better than Muriel. Perhaps I can have you taken off. Okay, sorry, not anything. No, she would be worse than Muriel. I'll speak to the king. So he's, for some reason, is getting jealous because she's talking to another bloke. And he's so pathetic a character. I did, I forgot that he was supposed to be after in the first series. You would do that for me. Once again, it doesn't make sense. He's the leader of a nation now. They'll all be after him. Mate, at this point, you can do better. I can make a change for you, though. I can keep, we're friends. I can keep your title while I crush everyone else under my boot. The scar. Oh, oh, you're all insufferable and horrible. And why are you in my show? Why is everybody scum? Oh, it's like, oh, no one to root for in Numenor at all. Except maybe Farazon, who seems to be the only person with an IQ above 54. Yeah, despite what I said, being able to see into the future is quite the ability. So I should use this. That thing is really scratched, isn't it? You need to stop dropping that on the floor. Over to Gilgalad now. Or Gilgadaddy. And he gets Celebrimbor's letter about how I'm glad their rings have succeeded. I'm closing down the forge and I'm on my way to you. And his advisors start nagging him because of course they are. I have no time for your emotions. I'm trying to actually think about the problem. Nobody cares about your vibes. As such, because he's engaging his brain about the situation, he's not sure if he should send the army to Adar or wait to hear from Elrond and co because an army could be marching on a region. A region. Especially as his ring is giving him visions of danger for Celebrimbor. Danger such as uh, random rocks exploding, smoke, fish, and Sauron. Way to the future of Middle-earth on the whisper of that ring alone. Not alone, love. What do you want us to do? Go to Mordor? Okay, we're doing the opposite. That's definitely better. As if to underscore this dramatic pause. We cut to Alrond running at an average pace. He's dropped his cloak. He means business now. Shame he didn't bring a horse with him, really, isn't it? Deezer, though, whose tree has just got sunlight, has decided that she's going to take pruning shears to it immediately. My tree's coming back to life. Better cut it up. She starts whining, though, because she used to sing to the mountain, but now the ring just allows people to feel somehow like cheating. Like if you eat a chocolate bar on Weight Watchers. That kind of power would test even the most virtuous of dwarves. There's nothing innately corrupting about power. Power just enables you to do the thing that you would have done anyway, but lack the capability to. So the whole power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely only applies to evil people. I pray your father keeps his path true. As an objective point though, obviously. Not when you've got an evil ring manipulating you. So despite the fact that in a previous episode, she wouldn't buy a mushroom, she now wants to spend 150 gold pieces on a ball. 200 for a bloody rock. Women be shopping. It's a tuning crystal. 
know. I don't care. It's a sapphire amethyst that realigns your chakras. You put it by the bedside table and it tells you about your Pisces parallelogram. <laughs> so what happens is your head moves into your anus. But he says it's not my fault. The king's introduced a new 50% tax. So you know that somebody is pure evil scum. I mean, that's almost as bad as the UK. For every coin spent, another goes to the crown. Ring tribute, he calls it. Joran is annoyed because Joran is taxing Joran as a way to get all of his gold inside his ring. Ring tribute. You haven't really lived until you've had a gold-plated ring. This is for a wee girl's birthday next week. Hers. <laughs> Sir, this is for me. Either way, she ends up buying the ring, and then we get something from a carry-on sketch. Oh! Careful. She starts chasing it down among all the crowd who just keep kicking it further and further away. Excuse me. It's rolling. It's rolling. You seem to have kicked it. Until eventually, she follows it into a little cave with no lights before stumbling into a gargantuan, useless hole. Ah! Ah! It's like Jorin on his wedding night. Singing, though, enables her to locate the orb. But as she gets it back... Deezer must be hungry again. Can we stop dropping orbs on the ground, please? Although, if it was that fragile, I don't know why it didn't break the first time. Jorin, though, not that Jorin, this Jorin, gathers emissaries from the other seven kingdoms and explains the rings to them, the power that he can give them. But if your leaders want to be saved, if they want the light back, they need to come here to accept the ring in person and pay me a 50% tax. I find it very funny that this is what Rings of Power has chosen to symbolize evil for the dwarves, and they filmed it in the UK, which has worse laws. <laughs> this is a message of Rings of Power I can get behind. He ends his speech with this though. There is gold right beneath us. Yeah, I mean, I could see it. The thing is, everybody else should be able to see it as well. It's in full view. Look, there's tunnels that people walk down with torches. People live and work in this area. Right next to it, they can see it. You don't need someone messing with your ring for this kind of power. But Jorin's all, we have to dig deeper. We have to dive deep quickly, too deeply and greedily. Yes, it's just all references again. Who put on these restrictions? You did, I did, I've forgotten. Where's my ring? Where is it? Took it off. Where is it? What have you done with it? So he's already showing the paranoia about the ring and it's like, at least in these you have an excuse because Sauron has actually put his power into it. But he's been wearing it for what, like a day? I really wish there was a better explanation of time passing. He said your hand was feeling heavy. The weight of the ring, it's power, it's draining. He obviously realizes it's having an effect, but then when he takes it off, he forgets. Hmm, maybe I need to put it on again. Power. It was, it was. As he gives orders to dig though, Jorin, not Jorin, that Jorin turns up because you can't dig. Deezer, she's felt something. A nameless evil, ancient and powerful. How do you know that? All she heard was her stomach rumbling. It can't have been the first time she's heard her stomach rumble next to a big empty hole. But no, somehow just by hearing something going, I know it's an ancient evil and it's powerful. Could have been wind. She has been eating a lot of mushrooms recently. You mustn't dig. Of course, the king, overcome by the evil ring, is just like, no, dig. I can see the mines. We don't have to sing to them anymore. I can see all the veins. There is no evil there. Which doesn't really make any sense. It's like, so if the ring is evil and so it's hiding other evil from him, why would the ring want that to happen? The showrunners have pitched Sauron as wanting order all over the place. That he isn't actually evil. He just wants to control everything everybody because he thinks he can do it better. Well, in that case, why would he want the dwarves to be destroyed by a Balrog? That doesn't actually make any sense. But the showrunners in this, they don't care about plot holes. And if you point out their bad script writing and lack of talent, well, I mean, you're just a troll, aren't you? Really? You mock that which is sacred. I mock that which is absurd. I have named ye. That means it's true. Over with Keller Brimbor now and he gets offended when he hears a woman scream. <laughs> Sauron, are you cheating on me? If you wanted to do that in the office, you should have asked me first. But as he goes over to see what the commotion's about, <laughs> items start moving on their own. Do my eyes deceive me? Or am I just an idiot? Sauron says we were making a new ring, casting a new design, and something happened. Where is she? In the fire, apparently. First Sauron's popped in there, now she has. Look out! I mean, why are we putting an anvil in the ceiling anyway, to be honest? Just leave it there, it's doing no harm. Maybe don't tie it up above people's heads? A hammer, though, starts flying around the room. And Kella Brimble, the old granny, decides I can wrestle her. She doesn't even have dangly bits. Careful, mate. You don't know where you're grabbing. Turns out, though, she was just wearing a ring and she got sent to the unseen realm. 
<laughs> By the way, if you're wondering, none of this is canon because that character doesn't exist. Because we need more women in STEM. If they see themselves as engineers, they'll become engineers. She says, though, I was in a place like this, but it was shrouded in smoke. I saw something. At first, I thought it was the forge, but it wasn't. And its skin was made of flames. Galadriel's boyfriend, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was me! Reeking of death, I saw its eyes. And he said, Galadriel. I think it's been here among us all along. Yeah, but how do you know that? Oh, I think it was here a week last Tuesday, actually. Yeah, because I saw his eyes. Celebrimbo starts asking, though, what did you change? Uh, you used more mithril? No, you can't do that. Bearing in mind that the only reason they used less mithril is because they didn't have any more mithril. They had to water it down, which is how they invented alloys. Right up until this moment, there was never a problem with using too much mithril. So we sought to fortify the alloy by adding more mithril. No, no. No! I need that mithril for me pension. If you'd wanted to do that, you should have... Should have asked me. Ah, and now I find the trap. I don't really know why Sauron decided to make a ring that did this rather than just explode or something, but somehow it seems to have an effect on Calibrimbor. Just as he's about to help them though, soldiers come in. It's from Jorin. There's something wrong with the rings. Now, I do like the camera shot between the dwarf and Calibrimbor. I'm just not sure where his legs are. <laughs> Down at the bottom of the camera, which is a bit off the screen, is about Calibrimbor's knees. His legs must be shorter than his knees. The king is colder, quicker to anger. There must be something wrong with your ring, Calibrimbor. It's like, yes, Sauron's been destroyed it for weeks. Greed is not his way. It never has been. He has a habit of banging his secretaries, but he's never been greedy. Calibrimbor, though, won't hear that there's something wrong with the ring. The same process, same materials, even the same tools as for the three. Uh, but a couple of episodes back, the people that were wearing those rings were talking about how evil they were as well. Oh, look, I can control people's minds. Everyone is evil in Rings of Power. Or thirsty. Or both. She's an elf disgrace. But that means if there isn't a problem with the ring, could it be a problem with the people that made it? There may be the fault in the ring maker. What do you mean? You couldn't possibly be accusing me. Despite the fact that the dwarves and the elves haven't trusted each other, surely you can't deny, did it? How much do you really know about this? Anatar. 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 Nothing except his name is almost impossible to pronounce. That said, Anatar is watching them before going in and talking to his mythical servants who didn't exist. Maybe it's not Jorin that likes to bang his secretary, but it is nice of Calibrimbor to share her around as well. At least he's not greedy. Sauron, though, spins her a tale that that fiery monster with the dark, evil eyes that stinks of death. Well, that's actually Calibrimbor. Making the rings has drained him, and Anatar wants to heal him before he actually tells anyone about it. And she just goes along with this, despite saying that he stank of death. He tells her that the unseen world actually highlights people as they really are. Lord Calabrim. Yes. And she just accepts it. This random guy, which she has seen change form, but I don't think ever been explained to it who he is. And the only reason she trusts him is because, oh, he had a boo-boo on his shoulder and then got wet with me. Crafting the three and the seven has left him diminished. Diminished? She said he stank of death? Reeking of death? He had dark eyes of evil. And he's just like, well, that sounds like Calabrim bought him made some rings stinks of death. Obvious. But she promises that she won't tell Calibrimbor or anyone else about what she's learned that Calibrimbor stinks of death and is vulnerable to the shadow. When the light caught your hair, for a moment you seemed her perfect likeness. Who on earth could she possibly be? Why would we cast another blonde in Rings of Power? Who's like this? My Lady Galadriel's, of course. Yeah, Sarah wants to bang her now as well. It's a good bloke. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I squint, you look a bit like her, that'll do. This is a guy who can exist for thousands of years as slime under a cave eating rats. But he can't even go a couple of weeks without sniffing Galadriel's min- <laughs> Now, the weird thing is, she seems to be complimented by that. I know that Galadriel, oh, she's the Lady of Light. But he's still just gone, you know, you remind me of my ex. Always goes down really well with the ladies, that one. Yeah. I want to bang you because you look like my ex. Does he stink of death, Galadriel? Back with Numenor, and we're in a temple giving a prayer for the dead. This shrine is condemned by order of the king. For some reason, they want to just piss off the locals. Aren't you grouped together and like this place? We better remove it. We're taking over this for the aqueduct. This is the oldest shrine in Numenor. It's in the way of the new aqueduct. We call that progress. It's really moral. It's almost like if we had some books that were written decades ago, and then some other people that liked progress just came along and decided to rewrite them for their own ends. With their own morality and value system. They could worship evil. I, I, I'm just saying, they might have written into the script what they're doing. You mock 
that which is sacred. I mock that which is absurd. Leave willingly or leave by force. The king sends his apology. This might actually be J.D. Payne. How's it feel to have a daughter who's ashamed of you? No problem at all, actually. She's a crazy bit. And at the moment, I'm just thinking we should throw her into the ocean because the sea is always right. She must take after her mother because it turns out she's a traitorous little cow. All my responses were better than just chickening out, to be honest. The problem is the priest wants this statue because it's meant to hold the spirits of the dead and they won't pass off without the statue. And obviously, in a situation like this where you have absolutely no power and are clearly dealing with an arsehole, what you should do is antagonize him. Give him the relic. Give it to him, boy. Obviously, now he's going to do what you wanted him to do. When negotiating from a position of weakness against a superior enemy, what you should do is insult them. It's really smart to get your own way. He's an arsehole for doing it, but he's an arsehole for asking him that way. Give it to him, boy. There is no good person in this scenario. Yes, the guy shouldn't have come in and just destroyed one of the oldest temples. But the moment the other guy starts mouthing back at you, obviously you're going to smash the statue. It is his fault the statue got smashed. I don't know if you're aware, but I've been promoted to- On the plus hand, he redeems himself. Now all we need is for him to teach his daughter a lesson as well. What's that? You want to spine up with evil? Not my daughter, doesn't. Hold him. And I'm not really sure what his plan was here. I'm gonna punch him and then, what, get killed? Because that was probably what was gonna happen next. If that guy hadn't got involved anyway. Now at this point, I'm wondering why the soldiers don't stop him as well. Your boss is about to get manhandled. There's definitely more guards here. Why is no one rushing to his aid? The shrine is for the faithful kings, Minot. I don't see you praying. That's a really poor response, isn't it? Like, it's not even a shrine anymore. I'm dismantling it. Piss off. May the Valar forgive me. For what? <laughs> for being based. <laughs> Yeah! See this? This is how you deal with these problems. None of the fanning around. Oh, we're going to talk about everything for half an hour and then we're going to keep suffering by him and then eventually fat. No. Either you take him down or you do nothing. There is no middle ground. And he decides to take him down. Now, the thing is with this, one is a trained soldier. The other is just some random script writer or something from what I remember. I think he's an architect, actually. So you're going to have to forgive me when this happens. <laughs> How is the architect winning the fight against the soldier? Why did we pin him to the ground and not like pin his arms or keep hitting him in the face? <laughs> Instead, somehow the soldier ends up being drowned by the architect. And I had to think, what would I do in this scenario? And I think I would just grab him and roll into the water. If you're gonna drown me, we're both going. The only downside would be I'd probably lose as I think somebody of his proclivities would be far better at holding his breath. A lot more practice of blocking his airways. <laughs> so he starts drowning him for quite a while. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's being restrained by one guy and he's not even really trying to free himself. He's just like, oh no, if only I could go and help you. And then you have all these guys who are just like dealing with a couple of women at the back. <laughs> Their leader has been dying behind them in a fight. Like, no, I've got to deal with this tiny little woman. What's he, who's he dealing with? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know how he freed himself because he goes completely under the water. Hang on, I can move your arm, can't I? Because I'm far stronger than an architect. Ugh. <laughs> architect obviously escalates because now he realizes I'm out of my depth against a soldier. Why was I ever winning in the first place? And so pulls his sword. <laughs> After that, obviously the soldier wins because he should have done from the start and it didn't actually make any sense anything that's happened previously. Now comes a really stupid bit because he dislocates his shoulder. <laughs> nice work. And then just as justice is about to happen, obviously the low IQ members of the audience have to take over the script again. What do you think was going to happen? You can't take it to this point and stop. What do you think he's going to do to you? You only had two choices. Leave the pissing temple or do this. There is no middle ground where you can dislocate his arm, put sword to his throat, and then just assume everything's going to be okay. You have gone too far now. And yet... I don't know why he gets released at that moment. That's, that's even more stupid, to be honest. Put it down, son. Don't be an idiot. That's an order. He's not your captain. Someone that petrified will never let you live this down. They will take all their envy, their fear, and their hate, and they will just give it straight back to you and blame you for them being inadequate. You never, ever let the weak get into a position of power. Ever. <laughs> Instead, he throws the sword down next to the weak person and walks off as if, oh yeah, everyone's just going to forget that, obviously. Our captain. 
You get what you deserve. This is the most predictable and obvious thing in the world. Once you talk it to that point, you could never let him get away. Why'd you keep kicking him? You'd already won the fight. Knocking him down was the first fight. I wanted to win all the next ones too. And that's what's happened to him. Oh, actually, yeah, I probably should just let you kill him. But I was an idiot and for some reason told you not to. For absolutely no reason whatsoever. So he got what he deserved. That was always how he was going to behave because he's weak and that's what they do when they get power. And the guy who now suddenly cares about his life for some reason is upset, despite the fact that he was the one that caused it. All in all, this scene did nothing but piss me off. Not because it was badly written, just because this is one of the most predictable scenarios ever and yet every show repeats it in the same way and it just turns everyone into an idiot. It's a scene I've seen so many times before. Inform the jailer he was the one who started the uprising. The only surprising thing is that they kept him alive as well. Well, which wouldn't have happened either. Speaking of absolutely idiotic scenes that makes no sense, we got Calibrimbor telling Sauron that there's something wrong with the rings and Sauron going, no, no, he must be projecting. Just be mindful, someone is not manipulating you. Sauron tries to gaslight him that actually he's being manipulated by other people and then when he realises it's not working, goes to a different tactic. No, enough. Did you, in some way, alter the dwarven rings, yes or no? Now at this bit is the one tactic that Sauron has done so far that I liked. It is a clever response and a cool way to twist it in order to make Celebrimbor doubt himself. This cool tactic and cool line lasts for about 60 seconds. <laughs> and then they take what is a legitimately good idea and not only obliterate it, but turn it into one of the most stupid ideas alive. This is one of the issues with even trying to find something to compliment about Rings of Power because it never lasts and it always gets perverted into something worse. So, oh, I like that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Why did you do that with it? No. We did. What? Where on earth are you going to go with this? These are matters of spirit as much as craft. This time he brought deceit into the process. It's essentially where he goes is that Calibrimbor, when he lied to Gilgalad about the forge, when he sent the letter that we we're only going to make three, denied his king's leadership and said they were going to go off to join Gilgalad. Gilgad daddy. Oh! They actually tainted the forge, tainted themselves, and that would have gone into the rings and tainted the rings. And so the reason why they're now playing up is because of what Celebrimbor did. It works, it's logical, and it fits consistently within all the rules that Rings of Power has set for itself. That was never going to last, was it, really? That was never going to last. We forged beneath a cloak of deception. Confess the truth to your high king. Or now Sauron is actually telling it, yeah, we, you know, we, sh we should go and fix it. I'm like, hang on, that won't actually do much. If you went to Gilgalad, Gilgad Daddy, and confessed what you'd done, yeah, the lie would have been out in the open, but the rings have already been forged. That will's already got into them. So that won't really do anything unless you could think you can get the rings back from the dwarves. So I'm not really sure what his plan was when he's like, we should go and confess. Either way, Calabrimbor's hearing none of it. He would never permit me to forge anything again. Okay, so if you can't go to Gilgalad, Gilgad Daddy, because you want to keep forging, well, there's nothing you can do then. You're just going to have to try and hide what you've done and deny everything. Hope the rings don't have too much of a negative impact and just try and gaslight everyone that they're okay. That's that's the only logical course of action. What you certainly wouldn't do is this. Is it either that or we plunge straight on? How does that make any sense? Oh yeah, so we made three good rings and then we had them under a cloak of deceit and made seven evil rings. So if we're not going to own up to it, our only other solution is to just to make nine more evil rings and double down on being evil. Why is Celebrimbor now officially evil? Even deeper into the maelstrom. Why would we want to plunge deeper into evil, Sauron? <laughs> I think he's forgotten that he's supposed to be an angel. Meanwhile, Jorin is trying to talk to Jorin about Jorin's ring that doesn't own to Jorin but does belong to the other Jorin. That there's evil in Jorin's rings and Jorin doesn't want Jorin to wear it. We mustn't use them anymore. But for some reason, the ring is essentially like the Ring of Power and nobody wants to give it up. Ooh. And so Jorin, in an attempt to bribe his son to basically shut up and go away. I need your axe. I remember. Do you remember? Prince Doran. If I make you royalty, will you piss off and leave me alone so I can wear this evil ring in peace? Sure. So obviously we have to cut over his wife so that she can be disappointed about her husband essentially being bribed. I tried. I tried, but he just gave me some money and a title and I was like, guess that's worth the downfall of our people. I tried to tell him. But Deezer has a promise that he needs to make. And I thought the promise was going to be, promise me that you'll try and save our people. Promise me that if he turns evil, you'll take him down. Promise me you'll do best for our kingdom. No. Swear it that you will never wear one of those rings. They were only made because of you. He wanted nothing to do with them. And you just nagged him to death as the drip that wears away the rock. Well, it turns out you are a massive drip, aren't you, really? Somehow we've tried to make out that she's the voice of reason when she's the cause of all of it. So Calibrimbor gives a speech about how the art 
boss can disobey you, and we need to redouble our efforts, come up with new methods and everything. And if anybody doesn't give you 100%, then I am going to fire you, and you will not be a crafter in a ragion. Do you all understand? Did hubris and sloth come together to dull your attention? You do seem to have recruited basically one of everything in this picture. Maybe competency varies. We must atone for our mistakes in the only way we can. Completing the rings together. It doesn't make any sense. We've made three good rings, then we made seven evil rings. So if we make nine more, even more evil rings, it'll balance it out. Pissing inside. The nine must do far more than bring aid. Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah, they're gonna use the season one line again, that somehow three brings balance, despite the fact that we got three, then nine, and seven. And somehow redeem the seven. How? They're not even going to the dwarves, you insane lunatic. They must redeem us all. Yes, only by making nine evil rings can we be redeemed in front of Sauron. I, I, at this point, I don't even know what the plan is. It's so nonsensical and obviously evil. If the Seven turned evil because there was deceit, you're now doubling down on deceit. Even by his own logic, this doesn't make any sense. Have I made myself play? Yes, but I just don't know why. As he leaves, though, the people start mumbling, what's got into him? I don't understand. And Sauron seizes on the moment to uh, gain their loyalty. Reassure them. He's a nice fellow. He says your master may seem unreasonable, intemperate. His command's even impossible. Congratulations, Sauron. Sauron, you're really doing a great job of convincing them with this start, aren't you? So much that depends on your success. He's under a lot of pressure, you see. And so he goes upstairs to have a little cry. Maybe he thinks if he disappoints Sauron, then he won't be able to have his ring destroyed anymore. I think... I'm sorry. And we get some legitimately good acting, which at this point symbolizes most people that are still watching this episode. I don't know how I've got this far, but it's really taken its toll. We will complete the rings of power. Oh, he's Satan and he's so beautiful. He said I look like Galadriel. She's a disgrace. I don't think I'm thirsty just because I work by a fire all the time. Shall we begin? We begin making baby Saurons. They can scuttle around the floor. And then after that scene where you think nothing more stupid can happen than that scene, right? No, because somehow the orcs turn up. <laughs> They're just fathers out on a walk with their children. They just want peace and a loving home. Oh, by the way, they've somehow reached a region without even being discovered. Remember when Sauron just walked back into Mordor and they said he was spotted by four different scouts just walking on his own? You must have thousands of owls all over the place to have spotted that. Not a single person spotted an orc. Not one. These orcs aren't even hiding. They're leaving a massive trail through the forest as they run. Invisible orcs. At that point, though, Alrond, getting his horse, manages to get back to Gilgalad and he's like, I found all the orcs. They're going to a region. We need to send the army there to protect Calabrim and his rings of power. The orcs are not in Mordor. And then we find out that Gilgalad Gil is a complete idiot. A legion of them headed for a region. Galadriel was right. Oh, nobody ever thought we'd say that. This might be the first time in the entire series. I mean, she may be evil and thirsty and want little Sauron scuttling all over the floor and up the walls. But this time she was right. You must send the army to a region. That will not be possible. Have you sent it to Mordor? This is because that woman was advising you, wasn't it? I told you not to listen. I don't even know what she was doing in the room. There wasn't a loaf of bread in sight. Our armies cannot defeat both Adar and Sauron. Okay, so first, worry about your walls. Worry about the city you can defend. Rather than far-flung Mordor, protect your leading mind and his city of crafters that will save you the war. Meanwhile, the orcs are pushing Galadriel into a tiny little camp, really, and they're like, oh, we put you in this cage for weeks. How on earth did you find a hairdresser to curl it for you in there? <laughs> The thing is though, just as you're getting all excited because you think the orc is just gonna like smack her in the face with his spear. What? It literally just went like that. It has a padlock on it. Why didn't you use the key? You are gonna really burn through these cages if you just snap the padlock off every single time you open them. What was wrong with the key? <laughs> Thing is, though, this guy, just a loving father, out with his children to protect his own homeland. Isn't this the same guy that said, I don't want to go to war and kill people. I just want to protect my own baby. We are safe here. We have a home. Must we go to war again? Well, it turns out the moment he's got someone in front of him. Like, yeah, I got you, Caladriel. I'm going to feed you to my spawn. Well, he would have done if Adar hadn't stopped him. But as she pulls, like, a dagger out of her hair or something, I didn't bring you here as a prisoner. I brought you here to ally against Sauron. This 
was the worst episode of season two so far. Maybe ever, but I can't remember season one that much. What this was, was soap opera waffling, badly written, everyone was evil, no one's plot motivations made sense, and we're using the old cliche of, no, don't kill him, just for him to die immediately afterwards, because he's an idiot to listen to the idiot that is telling him not to do his only option. And okay, and okay maybe the scene in the temple is just my pet peeve that I hate about TV shows. But to get Sauron to go, well, you know, we have been making these evil rings, and just admit it to him. Oh yeah, those dwarven rings are t evil and they are tainted. We should probably just make some more though, and Calibre was like, yes, we'll definitely make some more evil rings. Is the most stupid and anti-Tolkien thing I think you could have possibly done. You wrote yourself into a corner by making the rings in the wrong order, and I don't think you know how to dig yourself out of it. And so everyone looks evil, everyone looks thirsty, and nothing anyone does makes any sense. The only good things about this episode is we didn't have any of the half foots of stranger nonsense in it, combined with no Alrond or Arinder telling all the thirsty people the truth, the few bits I'd liked about the series were also excluded, and so I ended up with just an hour of waffling that didn't go anywhere. At the end of the episode, you're in the same place as at the start, and that's how Rings of Power always is. It never goes anywhere because it keeps resetting the story back to the position it started in. No plot lines just have an extended effect. Alron left Gilgalad to go to Celebrimbor and then ended up with Gilgalad again, and that's why everything feels like a waste of time. I thought episode 3 was the worst so far, but episode 5 doubles down on all of it, and I don't think there's any excuse for that. But those are just my thoughts, what are yours? Let me know down in the comments below, like the video if you like the video, subscribe for more videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.